Okay, so part two of plan lighting installations. We finished off the last one on this summary here. Now we're moving into more about the uh, specifics of uh, how we would plan uh, lighting, choose the, the lights that we want, etc. in a um, lighting installation. So let's get straight into it. Luminaires can be class classified according to how they distribute light, as we can see on the um, on the slide here. Uh, so we have direct, semi-direct, general diffusing, semi-diffused, and indirect. Um, uh, and those are based on the percentage of upward versus downward lights, basically. If we look at the direct one there, we'll see that um, it's uh, 0 to 10% upward, 90 to 10% downward, 90 to 100%, I think that's supposed to be, 90 to 100% downward light, and so that would be our distribution curve that would be look, what it would look like in terms of how much is going down if we look down towards the bottom here we're going to have a look at indirect lighting uh, we'll wait for the uh, the little bar to go away there uh, but our indirect lighting is going to be about 90 to 100 percent um, 90 to 100 percent upwards and only maybe 10 percent downwards uh, and here is our distribution curve here. So all of our light is going up. Uh, and the theory on this one is that light will go up and bounce off the ceiling and come down. So it would be a, a diffused kind of light. So we're not getting any direct lighting from the, uh, or very little direct lighting from the, uh, from the lamp into our eyes or onto a surface. Um, it would be better for a distribution of light, right? So a uniform distribution because there's no direct beam from that lamp to any in the, any given place. Uh, but it's probably going to be, uh, we're going to lose a little bit of light because it's going to bounce around everywhere and stuff is going to get absorbed, you know, surfaces absorb, absorb light unless they're a mirror, they're not reflecting all of it. So the more indirect our lighting is, the more we'll lose. Okay, applications. Any luminaire can be used to create a different lighting effect. If we have a look here, what have we got? We've got these uh, hanging, uh, they look like probably incandescents, and they're being used, they're hanging quite low with a, uh, a, a very uh, covered shade on them there. So, so we can see from that that those, those lamps are probably uh, very direct type of lighting. So we're not going to have much lighting light from those lamps coming out the sides or out the top all of that light is going to be going downward and they're hung quite low over the surface that they're illuminating which suggests to me that these lights are primarily for surface work so that light is shining directly on the surface in front of me so that's an interesting sort of application there okay direct lighting system is popular in hotel dining rooms the lighting is concentrated onto the working plane very little light lighting is lost by being absorbed into surrounding surfaces such as walls and ceilings type of lighting this type of lighting will produce dark shadows can also happen in houses where down lights are used okay so what are we talking about here direct lighting as we said on a couple of slides previously our direct lighting is going to be and the majority of our light is going downwards uh, and not much of it is going up um, as i said before uh, if we look at this one little light is being lost by absorbed into surrounding surfaces as i said with the uh, indirect lighting that the more indirect our lighting is the more we're relying on that light bouncing off ceilings and walls uh, but we will lose some light when we do that so we'll get more uniform lighting with indirect but we're losing light by um by being absorbed into surfaces this kind of direct light um we won't lose much so in a hotel dining room for example or a restaurant dining room i don't know why we need to say hotel specifically but certainly in a restaurant dining room if we think about um the type of lighting that we want then they're directly on the tables like this picture here uh, and actually the shadows and other locations are probably not that big a deal. Uh, really, we, we are focused in that context. We're focused on the tables themselves. Uh, and therefore, um, the lighting is focused on that same area. Uh, there needs to be light elsewhere, like patrons moving about the dining room. We don't want them to be so dark and fall over. And then obviously... Uh, the waiting staff as well need to move around and work in that area, but certainly they, they, they probably only need enough light to move around, whereas uh, that focus light wants to be on the, on the tables. 
Uh, so that's a, a, a lighting effect. And then you can see with those these luminaires here, again, they're similar to the ones in the previous slide where we've got those large shades um, preventing any light being um, lost sideways or upwards. So it's projected downwards, big dish shaped shades. And also that they're hanging quite low. Obviously not as low as in that previous slide. We need, you know, you don't want them so low that people are gonna bash their heads on them. Um, but the further, the closer we have the luminaire to the surface to be illuminated, then the less losses that we're gonna have and the more direct and concentrated light we will get. So, uh, so that's an interesting effect there. The indirect lighting. So this is the complete opposite of direct lighting. The ceiling and the walls are used to diffuse the light source. So diffuse means to scatter, if you like, or spread. Uh, the result was an evenly spread light without dark shadows. The absence of direct or reflected glare from the luminaire makes this type of lighting particularly suitable for rooms where, for example, reflected glare off a computer monitor screen could be a distraction to the person working on it. Uh, so yeah, I talked a little bit on a couple of slides ago about the um, uh, about that diffused type of lighting source. So. Um, light uh, being essentially uh, no direct light or very little direct light that's shining on anything that light comes off the ceiling to the walls it bounces around and the more we bounce it around the more diffused or spread or scattered uh, it will get and therefore the more uniform that lighting will be if you think about you know having a spotlight directly over you or looking up into directly into a spotlight this is essentially the exact opposite of that right um, uh, we have the lighting source uh, not essentially not visible to our eye at all and then like in this picture here um, the lighting source I, I can't see that lamp all the light is coming out the top it's coming off the ceiling that um, really really good nice uniform um, delivery all of that kind of stuff the biggest downside here is the amount of light that we're going to lose uh, because every surface will absorb some light general diffusing Diffused light is a soft light with neither the intensity nor the glare of direct light. It is scattered and comes from all directions. The general diffusing type of luminaire is used as a lighting, lighting for homes, shops and some offices. It relies on the walls and ceilings being clean and light in colour to reflect and produce an even spread of light. Midway between the direct and general diffusing luminaires are the semi-direct luminaire. Many modern fluorescent luminaires and incandescent lampshades are semi-direct making them useful in offices, shops and homes. Semi-indirect luminaires have many of the advantages of indirect luminaires but are more efficient. They produce the soft shadow, non-glare type of lighting commonly used in boardrooms and reception rooms. So one way that we, uh, one really common way that we will see diffusing uh, use, and you can kind of see it here in this, uh, in this picture, is that we will have a, um, a white or semi-translucent um, glass or plastic covering over the light itself. You'll see this uh, pretty commonly in uh, fluorescent lighting. So that frosted color. So uh, that frosting will be will diffuse the diffuse the light a little bit more so we have way less direct uh, lighting. If you think about fluorescent um, fluorescent light covers, uh, hard to see because we, we obviously don't have a situation where I can show you these things, but often you'll see them with the kind of bumps or uh, little uh, ridges and stuff on them, they, that's part of the diffusing as well. So all of those little bumps and knobs on the cover um, serve to scatter the light in different directions. And the more you scatter it, and it, essentially scattering it randomly, the more you scatter it, then the, um, the more uniformity of light distribution that we will get. And most often, most often, this is the type, these are the kind of type of uh, lights that we will see, right? Um, direct lighting, uh, I suppose it's fairly common in your homes, but not to the point where we saw in those slides in the dining room. Uh, and then the indirect stuff, again, you'll, you'll see it around, but it's not particularly common to have 100% indirect lighting. Uh, that would probably be quite a weird effect. So some sort of general diffusing is, is our most common type of lighting. All right, so we have, uh, have a list here. I won't read all of these, but um, type of lamps, the applications, advantages and disadvantages. So um, no doubt this will come up in the test, so it'll be worth uh, at least reading this, maybe even putting a bookmark on it so you can come back to it later. Um, what have we got here? So uh, some of the highlights here in terms of um, 
advantages and disadvantages. Uh, a recessed incandescent, so that's a normal um, incandescent light, right, that in a downlight. So there's a fire risk there, remember, because we, if we mount a, those in the ceiling, and, uh, and they're the hottest type of lights. Um, so that's worth noting. Um, obviously the advantage of LED, well, we know well, high energy efficiency, long life, very little heat. In most, in most cases, they will replace all of these things here. Um, yeah, I won't go too much into that. You guys can all read. And same over here, same over here. Uh, what have we got here? Sodium, uh, high pressure sodium vapor and low pressure sodium vapor have that bad color rendering. So they're that very yellow, that very yellow light, um, which we use for street lights generally. Um, the, the low pressure sodium uh, is very, very efficient. So I think, I think from the numbers that we've seen in previous units, I, I would have to do a bit of research to confirm this, but I'm seeing numbers there that the efficacy, you remember that's our uh, light output over wattage, they actually low pressure sodium vapor could be better than an LED. But, uh, the color rendering is terrible. The color rendering is hopeless. They are the worst by miles. I think we had one in the, uh, I put, put my 5 one up in 405, which most of you probably would remember. Um, and it's a, such a strange kind of lighting that it even makes your eyes feel weird. Uh, certainly if you're ever in a street that's completely illuminated by uh, low pressure sodium vapor, you can tell. Just, it makes everything look strange. The rest of that stuff, um, we've covered these before, and again, you can read through those. Pause the video if you need to. Uh, here we have that same, uh, num that same table, average lumen outputs per uh, wattage. Uh, we can get a gauge there of which ones are, uh, which ones give us a better efficacy. And then we've seen that one as well. We have done that example, I will move straight past that. If you've seen this table, I'll move straight past that. Right, inverse square law. So we did this last time. We did this last time we looked at lighting, uh, but we didn't do it very well in the Palmana site. I didn't do it very well either. So let's spend a little bit more time talking about this. The illuminance, so that's our E, and it's lux, so that's our number, our amount of, um, that's our amount of, lost the word, the amount of uh, lumens per square meter. So the illuminance at a point on a surface is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the light source. Well, that's not very friendly language, is it? So inversely proportional, that means, uh, we know what this means, that proportional means as one gets bigger, the other gets bigger. Inversely proportional means as something gets bigger, the other thing gets smaller. So if it's inversely proportional, that means the illuminance is going down as the distance from the light source goes up, which makes sense, right? So it's explained, it's worded there in a very uh, difficult kind of way, but it's not a difficult concept for us to understand. The further I move that light away from the source, uh, sorry, the further I move the light source away from the surface being illuminated, then the uh, less light I'll have on that surface. That makes sense. So that's what we mean by inversely proportional. And it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the light source. So, um, as I so it's going to be an exponential graph there. As I uh, move, if I move from one meter to two meters, then it's going to be um, the square of that change will be how much the, the luminous intensity changes. So we're going to go luminous intensity in can, uh, candela divided by the distance from the source squared. Again, uh, we've seen this before, right, where, uh, well, not, well, we have seen this formula, but um, what I mean is, if you understand this, that's good, uh, that's great. If you don't understand this, as long as you remember the formula, you, you can identify that formula and utilize it and put the numbers into it, then that'll get you by. Uh, so here's an example here of, uh, well, this is not quite the same thing, so we're not talking about distance from source. This is an example that we did before. It's the total flux divided by the total surface area given a uniform uh, uniform intensity. So the inverse square law applies to areas where the source is perpendicular to an illuminated surface. 
if the surface is turned through an angle to the perpendicular, a correction of cos phi must be used. Cos phi being, or cos of the, uh, of the angle, um, cosine of whatever angle it is. So if we imagine, normally we've got our light surf, lights. Um, let me just look at my video feed so if I'm making, doing stuff with my hands, you guys can see that. Okay, good. So normally I have my light source here and my surface here, and that's you know straight up and down. But what this cosine law is talking about is that, um, or the inverse square law is that what if what if my light source was here but my surface to be illuminated was here so my light's coming down like that or what if it was at an angle or if my surface was flat and my light is over over here or over here at an angle to my surface so in that case um, I would go luminous intensity times the cosine of the angle and that's easy, right? We know about angles and cosines and stuff. Now we've done heaps of trigonometry, so this should be way easier. So I'll take the luminous intensity, multiply it by cosine of the angle, divide that by the distance from the source squared. So if I have a uh, luminous intensity of 1,000 candela, and it's at 45 degrees to the surface, and it is 2 meters away, then I would go 1,000 times cosine of 45 divided by 2 meters squared. Simple. All I need to do is uh, enter those values into the equation. And here we have an example. So we've got a lamp emitting two, 200 candela in all directions below the horizontal. So that's 200 candela in every direction from the lamp, do, 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 every direction. And it's mounted 2 metres above the centre of a circular table, 3 metres in diameter, which means 1.5 metres from the centre to the outer edge, or 3 metres from outer edge to outer edge. Calculate the maximum and minimum illuminances on the surface of the table. Well, so our maximum illuminance will be just the, uh, the first one, right? So, because the, the, um, the light will be directly above directly above the surface. So we we'll go luminous intensity, 200, and distance from source was 2 meters. So it should be 200 divided by 2 meters squared, which would be 4. So we, that first one would be 200 divided by 4, so 50. So the illuminance should be 50 lux directly below the lamp on the table. Let's have a look. There we have it there. So our maximum intensity will be directly below the light, as I said. It's 2 meters and it's 200, 200 candela. So we go 200 divided by two squared. So the amount, the illuminance divided by the distance squared, and it gives us 50 lux. So that means if I put my light meter right here, it's gonna tell me there's 50 lux there. In our second example, so we've got an angle here, and we have to work out our angle, what do we need? Luminous intensity, we know that, it's 200. Multiplied by cos of the angle, so we have to work that out, and then divided by the distance from the source. So what that's telling us is that this here, luminous intensity over distance from source squared is the same formula as we use. So we're just factoring in the angle, so that's telling us that as the um, light goes out on an angle, we're gonna have less. The greater the angle, the less the light's gonna be, so the bigger that number will get. So we're gonna cos of the angle, um, we've worked out here what our angle would be and how are we going to do that? Well, we use uh, soccer toa, right? Because we have a 90 degree angle here. So then that means that this, uh, if we want to work out that angle, this will be our adjacent side. This will be our opposite side. So we would go uh, tan. We'll use toa opposite over adjacent. Tan, 1.5 divided by 2. And I'll do that on my calculator here. Let's pull up the calculator here. Let's see that. So I'll go tan 2.5 divided by 1.5. Tan 2.5 divided by 1.5 should be that angle there, right? Because I'm going tan opposite, that's 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5
divided by j sub t o a. Okay, so it should be 1.5 divided by 2.5 a. Subtract these on the 10. 1.5 divided by 2.5. Oh, inverse tangent, inverse tangent, because we're trying to find a, an angle. 10 to the negative 1, 1 1.5 divided by 2.5. I've got uh, my answer here is 30.96 degrees. 30.96 degrees is the answer on here is 36.87. Have I done something wrong? Oh, I used 2.5. Man, this is terrible. My apologies, team. Let's try that again. I said uh, 1.5 is opposite divided by 2.5 adjacent, but that is not true. So I go 10 is 2 meters, not 1.5. 10 opposite 1.5 divided by adjacent 2. So that is the formula I'm using. 10 to the negative 1, 1 1.5 divided by 2. Opposite divided by adjacent. 1.5 divided by 2. And the answer given there is 36.86 degrees. So there it is there. Inverse tan, 1.5 divided by 2. So that's 10 opposite over adjacent equals 36.86 degrees and if we look here we have 36.87 doesn't say cool hey that's not a bad way to teach maths out of video so uh, we're going to use that angle so we're going to use the inverse the cosine law here in a luminous intensity 200 times cos of the angle angle is 36.87 uh, divided by distance from source 2 uh, distance from source squared, so 2 meters squared. So we go 200 times cos of 36.87 divided by 2.5 squared equals 25.6 lux. Let me pump that into my calculator again so you guys can see it. I'm going to go... going to go uh, 200 times cos of the angle is 36.87 and then we're going to go divided by to uh, put some brackets around that 2.5 squared so there's my formula there 200 times cos 36.87 divided by 2.5 squared. Is that the right? Is that correct? Uh, the 2.5 I see. So the 2.5 uh, I haven't worked that out but the 2.5 is coming from uh, the length of that hypotenuse there. So we haven't worked that out so um, we would uh, we're using in terms of the distance it's not two meters anymore because we're not measuring from there to there we're measuring from the light source out to the edge because we want the illumination at the edge so it's 2.5 so we would use pythagoras pythagoras would decide so we have two meters and 1.5 now if we're smart we'll see that uh, this is a three four five triangle so uh, if this is three and this is four then this must be five and uh, that means that three times half a meter four times half a meter, so five times half a meter would be 2.5, so that's pretty easy to work out. So first we need to work out that, which is 2.5, that's why we're using 2.5 squared here. So if I hit equals on that one, Anyway, I get 
25.5999, so 25 point seconds in the CPU. So again, our formula, 200 candela times cons of the angle, which we worked out using trigonometry, uh, divided by the distance squared, and we worked out that distance again using trigonometry. Pretty sure we had a question like that in the last test that we looked at on this topic. I'm not sure if we've got one in this one, but if we do, I think that we're going to be far more prepared. Uh, so explanation on the mathematical terms used here. The 2 plus j 1.5 is a mathematical form known as rectangular. It represents the adjacent and opposite sides of a right angle triangle. They're then converted to your, by your calculators to another form known as polar 2.5, 36 degrees. These second values represent the hypotenuse and the angle. Whilst your calculators are completely capable of doing the equation, an alternative method is to use Pythagoras and trigonometry to convert from rectangular to polar. Uh, look, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna talk about that because we've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks um, figuring out how to do our trigonometry. And, uh, and I think we're pretty good at it. So I'm pretty sure that nearly all of us would be able to look at that triangle and work out the angle and the length of that side without too much difficulty and if uh, and if you're trouble having trouble with that that at all please come and talk to me give me a bell uh, let me know um, this is an alternative method of doing that which as it says your calculator can do but if we don't need to know that if we're uh, if we're comfortable with using Sokatoa and, and normal trigonometry then uh, why would we why would we complicate things any further I'm not going to do that so uh, if you know this and it makes sense to you, feel free to use it. If you don't, let's stick with our stick to the trigonometry that we know. Okay, and uh, here is how we're going to find that hypotenuse: a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So two, because that was the distance from top to bottom, plus one point five was our distance from left to right on the table to the table edge. Uh, so two squared plus one point five squared equals six point two five squared. Square root of six point two five equals two point five. That's our distance from uh, the light out to the edge of our table. Find the angle. We go tan negative one opposite over adjacent. So it's tan negative one one point five over two, which we did. I showed you that on the calculator. It should be pretty easy unit for us to remember. Okay, that is the last slide. Right, first thing is first then. Uh, the second two digits for the test on this one will be three, four. So you should have the first two digits from the uh, previous video. Uh, second two digits will be three, four. So that gives you a four digit code. Uh, right, we're gonna have questions. There are two questions at the end of this test. Let me bring them up. Um, which ask you to do a written answer outside of canvas. The first one says, a kitchen area measures five meters long times four meters wide. Determine the lighting requirements to meet specifications with consideration of the most suitable lighting arrangement for this kitchen. Things to consider, color temperature, lighting type application, lux level, energy efficiency, health and safety aspects, positioning of appliances and workspaces. Produce a small report to indicate what is the best lighting for this kitchen and why you have chosen it. Produce a location diagram showing the numbers and positions of light fittings and switches. Upload to your report to Canvas. So this gives you the ability to upload uh, that report um, into the test. So there's a little button. Um, just let me, you guys can't see this. There's a little button in the test that allows you to upload that file. Uh, I'm happy if you do the rest of the test and then submit the test without those and then maybe do another attempt later and submit those files. Uh, you will need to draw those, you'll need to maybe take a photo of them if you have to or scan it if you can uh, and then upload those files. Uh, in terms of the report, what I expect you to write is uh, what type of lights you're going to use, how many you're going to use, what the wattage is, uh, and talk about why you've used them. Is it because they're the most efficient lights? Is it because the colors are right? Um, do whatever you want. Get, as long as you've got reasons, I don't mind. As long as your reasons make sense, there's no right or wrong answer here. If you say that you're going to use um, uh, down lights and you're going to put 60 of them in the ceiling because you um, want uh, high quality um, direct light on your surfaces, do that, I don't care. If you say you're going to do something completely different, if you're going to use spotlights, incandescents, fluorescents, LEDs, 
uh, whatever you like, you, you explain it. And, and all I'm looking for is an explanation of what you've done. The location diagram. So uh, your best explanation of what we're looking for in terms of the location diagram will be in your practical books for this module. I'm going to do a video perhaps today or maybe tomorrow um, on the practical uh, book and what I expect from that book. Uh, it will be best for you to go through that practical, to watch that practical video to get an idea of what I'm looking for in terms of drawing. But in basic terms, if you look in that practical book, uh, there are some example layouts in there. Uh, you will need uh, to have a layout for your kitchen. You can design it yourself if you like. But your layout diagram should uh, tell me where the things are, like where are your appliances, uh, because then where you put your lights in relation to those is important. Uh, and then you'll need to draw uh, the, the lights themselves and the switches. I want you to use standard symbols, so go back to the electrical symbols module and, um, and have a look at what symbols you should be using. Uh, so definitely use standard symbols. Uh, and then put it together, put it together, upload it, uh, let me know when you've done it and, um, and I'll have a look. If there's any feedback, uh, I will come back to you. If, uh, if you guys are struggling with this, get in touch with me and, and ask, ask the question. Um, alternatively, uh, there's probably some great resources on Google. If you go through the other YouTube videos on this, uh, on this module, you may find some good information there. Um, if you Google um, kitchen lighting layout, you'll probably find something useful. There. And be, be creative. We're not in a class, so I, I, can't, um, I can't give you everything. But if you're struggling, let me know. Okay, and that is the end of this video. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for the next one. See you then.